Hello, this is Kevin Cosby here in Louisville, Kentucky, St. Stephen Baptist Church with another powerful point to ponder as we spend meaningful moments with the master on a daily basis. Thank you for joining me again, <coughs> excuse me, for another powerful point to ponder as we continue the theme we began on Monday on the heels of the 4th of July in which we celebrate um, the pretense of justice in the United States of America. Does our brand of justice harmonize with what the Bible talks about when it comes to justice? And that's what we're looking at. Perhaps the most powerful justice passage chapter in the Bible without question is Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15. And Jesus quoted Deuteronomy chapter 15, 48 hours before his death. Judas was criticizing Mary for pouring precious perfume on Jesus' head. And Judas took out his calculator and said, you know what, we could have sold this perfume and used the proceeds to help the poor. And Jesus said, the poor you will have with you always. Notice what he says in Mark 14 and verse 7, you will always have the poor among you. Now, he was not being prescriptive. He's not saying that he wants the poor among us. He's being descriptive. He's saying you will have the poor among you because you won't do what I'm telling you to do in terms of having policies that help the poor. Now, the quote Jesus makes, notice we're in the gospel of Mark chapter 14, and the quote Jesus makes, he is pulling from the book of Deuteronomy, which is the last book of the Pentateuch. The five first books of the Old Testament are called the Penta. Penta means five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy, which means literally means a repeat of the law, is a justice book. And the 15th chapter of Deuteronomy, I'm convinced, is the justice chapter perhaps of the entire Bible, the justice chapter of the entire Bible. And Jesus is pulling from Deuteronomy 15, which is a chapter which is talking about helping the poor. Whenever you have uh, programs and policies and the church gets involved in trying to help the poor, especially through justice work, there are always some who will say, well, Jesus said, the poor you'll with you have you with you always as though Jesus was uh, promoting poverty or, or endorsing poverty. No, Jesus wants poverty eradicated. And how do we know Jesus wants poverty eradicated? We know he wants poverty eradicated because of his initial sermon. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, when Jesus preached his initial sermon, which would set the tone for his entire ministry, Jesus would say in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, these words, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to the poor. What is good news to the poor? Good news. If I'm poor, let me tell you what good news to the poor is. I don't have to be poor anymore. If I'm homeless, good news to the homeless is I have, or the houseless. Good news to the houseless who live on the street is I've got housing for you. I've got housing for you. Good news for the college student is I've got grant money for you or those who are in debt because of tuition. Good news to them is your debt has been canceled. That's good news to the poor. And the word poor here is referring to those who are economically destitute because the system has put them uh, in harm's way. Now, when it comes to poverty, you will find usually four basic explanations for poverty four basic explanations. And I want to give you the four basic explanations for poverty. The first is fate. You will have those who believe in predestination, that God has preordained poverty. So it's just a matter of fate. God is um, the, the, poor, the rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. Uh, God has made them that way and ordered their estate. That's a poem. The rich man in his castle, the poor man in his gate. God has made them that way and ordered their estate. Fate. And the person who probably best represents this whole idea that God has preordained that some be poor is Al Mohler and those who believe in predestination. He's the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dismiss his theology. Please dismiss it. And then there are those second F word who will say that you're poor, not because of faith, but you're poor second F word because of failure, failure, failure. And by failure, I mean 
that you are just innately inferior. Racism is the belief. That's what racism is. Racism is the belief in the supremacy of some people biologically, biologically determined uh, just based on skin color. That some uh, can't help but to fail because you don't have the mental, the capacities to succeed. And the one person who is best known for this is a man named Charles Mary, uh, who wrote a book called The Bell Curve. And basically in this book, he has argued for the innate uh, intellectual inferiority of black people. It's that, so you have those who say, no, black people are poor because of fate. Black people are poor because of innate failure. And then you have people who use the third F word and that's fault, fault. Black people are poor because it's their own fault. They have a toxic culture. Um, they don't believe in strong family structures. So you blame the victim, you blame the victim. And you know who probably best represents that position of fault? His name is Clarence Thomas, Clarence Thomas. So you have those who believe that we're poor because of fate, some believe we're poor because of failure, some believe we're poor because of fault. And then there's some who believe black people are failure because of an issue of fairness. That the structures and the systems advantages some and disadvantages others. For example, if, if a basketball rim, what is supposed to be 10 feet tall, and I'm not sure what the, 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 the circumference of the rim is, but let's say it's uh, two inches, two, 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 excuse me, two feet, two feet. I don't know what the circumference is, but if it's supposed to be two feet, 10 feet tall, and my rim is one foot and 13 foot tall, then that's not fair. The person who has a larger rim and his shoulder is going to do better than the person who has a bigger rim and a, a and, and, and shorter to the ground. Well, well, the issue of fairness, e equality is what Dr. Martin Luther King was saying, that the, the reason why things are the way they are, that black people are at the bottom is because it's an issue, not of fate. God didn't ordain. It's not an issue of failure, as Charles Murray would say. It's not an issue of fault, something uh, that's uh, toxic about black culture. It's an issue of fairness and inequality. And you have the sons and daughters of Martin Luther King today. You, some of you heard of Tamika Mallory or, or Kimberly Crenshaw, Derek Bell. Uh, for me, probably it's, uh, it's, it's always going to be uh, Yvette Carnell and Antonio Moore, who I think are the true uh, descendants of the philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr., saying that we have a problem of fairness. For example, here are 10 things that we can do immediately to correct poverty. Jesus doesn't want poverty. And here's what we can do. And that is tax the wealthy. Um, taxes. The Bible talks about we're supposed to pay taxes to Caesar. Uh, uh, if you read Romans 13, where it says, uh, uh, submit yourself to the government. If you keep reading Romans 13, he's going to talk about submit yourself to the government by paying your taxes. And we try to hold on to our taxes. And I understand, but you can't bless somebody else unless you have been taxed. Bottom line, if the Good Samaritan is helping the man who's been beat up on the road, he has put, imposed upon himself a tax on the oil that he's using to pour into the wounds of the man, uh, put the man on his own beast, he's taxing his beast, and when he takes him to the end, he pays for it, which means he's taxing himself in order to help somebody. There is no way you can help people unless you believe in taxing. Bottom line, taxing. Here's something else, universal single payer healthcare, making sure that the government provides healthcare for everybody so they can live longer. Guaranteed jobs bill, which means that uh, we have roads and bridges that need to be fixed. We have teachers, uh, students that need to be tutored. We got seniors that need to be provided for. We can create job employment to pay jobs that pay a living wage. That means that the wealth are going to have to be taxed. Voting rights protection, in which they're trying to suppress the black vote. Criminal justice reform, equitable funding of public schools, reparations, cancel student loan debt, in houselessness and immigration reform. 
These are things that immediately could eliminate poverty. It's not fate, it's not failure, it's not fault, it's fairness. Do these 10 things. And you wanna take a picture of these things because these are the things that Christians should be advocating for if you really are taking Jesus seriously because Jesus does not want poverty. We have an abundance in our world. There's not scarcity. The problem is not a problem of scarcity. The problem is a problem of abundance. Why are we praying to God to bless the poor when you got, and I have in my pocket, that which could bless the poor if we would not hoard and be greedy and be willing to be taxed and be a channel of blessings to somebody else? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Help us to be advocates of justice in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me with another powerful point to ponder. I hope you're learning something. Look, if you don't have a church home, we'd like to invite you to become a part of the St. Stephen Church. Email us and we will get back with you. We will get back with you. Even if you just need prayer, email us. We'll get back with you. New start at ssclive.org. Well, look, thank you for being with me again. I hope you have a blessed day the rest of the day. And uh, don't forget that during COVID-19, we covenant to stay safe, to stay sane, and never forget that God is in control. Love you much. I'll see you tomorrow.